Hello, everybody. Hello to the social media world, Facebook, everyone who's tuning in. Welcome to the Traverse Conversations and Connections Across the Movement, brought to you by the Rights and Democracy Institute. This is episode five of our monthly conversation series, where we will be exploring everything from navigating the daily peaks and valleys of the movement to how we think about liberation in general. My name is Giselle Hart, and I am the Development and Membership Coordinator for RDI. And I'm thrilled to be moderating today's episode of The Traverse because movement building and organizing is something that's brought an incredible amount of meaning and joy and purpose to my life. I grew up in a very conservative and affluent town on the south shore of Boston, Massachusetts, where I was raised by a single mother who has a chronic disability. And as a result of this, I didn't really see a lot of families that looked like mine growing up. And so it wasn't until I moved to New Hampshire for my freshman year at UNH that I discovered the joy of being in community where I felt a sense of belonging. And this community uh, happened to be the student climate movement. So, you know, this experience fundamentally changed me, uh, not only being in community with people who share my values for justice and public healing, but to be in community with people who actually believe that we, we do have the power to disrupt oppressive systems. So this is just movement building has really, it's, it's given me so much life and joy. And you know, this path has eventually led me to my current role at the Rights and Democracy Institute um, in development, making sure that our movement has the resources that it needs to be successful and to run radical campaigns. So tonight we are excited to introduce our movement reading group, which is a special initiative within RDI that's fostering a deep understanding of our movement and creating community all at the same time. And so our first book that we're reading all together uh, is going to be featured in our group it is The Purpose of Power by Alicia Garza. Uh, and she's the principal of the Black Futures Lab and a co-creator of the Black Lives Matter movement. I have her book right here uh, and we're gonna be talking about that later on. Uh, but last year at our annual Human Rights Award, we were actually joined by Alicia and George Gale, who is the executive director of our national partner, People's Action. And they came together for a conversation about the power of people's movements facilitated by uh, Kathy Albiza, who's the vice president of uh, institutional and sectoral change at Race Forward. And she's also a current board member of our board here at Rights and Democracy Institute. So tonight we're going to revisit the special conversation between the two of them on the power of social movements and organizing. And followed by this interview, we're gonna have a live discussion with uh, some current members of our movement reading group on Alicia's book, The Purpose of Power. So without further ado, here's Kathy, Alicia, and George. Question because uh, we all need inspiration. And today is Human Rights Day. We're here to honor and celebrate both historic and current human rights struggles, some of which you both lead. Human Rights Day, what most inspires you in a moment like this? What struggles have influenced you? And uh, either feel, feel free, either of you, to jump in first. This is a conversation. <laughs> first, hey, Alicia. Hi. Hi, George. Hi, Kathy. Hi. It's good to be here with everybody. Um, those introductions were awesome. I wish I got introduced like that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so funny. I was thinking I should cut my bio down. It's gotten a little long. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's jump in. George, take us away. You know, on this question, I don't know if you'd call it one of the great human rights struggles, but I just keep thinking about the last 10 years, because if you go back to like 2009, like social movements in this country were far and few between, like and we were not a movement or an organizing sector that was able to move our ideas 
into the national conversation. It was just really not a thing. We were slugging it out in the neighborhoods. We were maybe organizing against our mayor. And then in the aftermath of the financial crisis, um, organizing started to take off. People started to question corporate power. I think even started to question uh, capitalism in new ways. And we've had a string of social movements ranging from Occupy to, to the Dreamers movement, Black Lives Matter, Me Too, we had the Sanders campaign. And I think we're in a period of organizing where like progressives and people that care about social justice and organizers are able to move our ideas into the national conversation. And that is like a huge deal in a very different place than we were 10 years ago. And what I'm most excited about what's what comes next, because the challenge is we can move those ideas into the national conversation. We don't know how to make them real in people's lives. And so I feel like for progressives in the left, we're in like a key moment in our learning curve where we want to move beyond like moving ideas into the conversation and maybe even serving up them up for the right to kick our ass with them to figuring out how we're going to take those ideas and make them real in people's lives. I feel like we're on the right track. We're doing all the right things, but what comes next is part of our learning curve. Thank you. George, Alicia, can you share yours? Oh, yeah. Well, I could not agree with you more, George, and you beat me to it. That's what I get for serving you up first. <laughs> I think for me, the thing that I've been um, really sitting with lately in the movement is um, the original abolitionist movement and the movement to end chattel slavery in this country. And, you know, I'm just struck by um, how radical of an idea at that time, uh, not having human beings in bondage uh, and forcing uh, free labor uh, and justifying uh, an unbelievable brutality and violence against human beings, thinking about how radical that was um, at the time when you know, Harriet Tubman and John Brown and so many other abolitionists were fighting to end the institution of slavery. And it makes me think a lot about the parallels for today. Um, you know, I'll be honest, I've been up since 5 a.m. and I've been up cussing since 5 a.m. <laughs> um, and the reason that I started cussing initially, actually, uh, was, you know, a lot of the conversation that is happening right now around police reform and criminal system reform and how people cannot wrap their minds, right? Or at least they say they can't wrap their minds around what it would look like uh, to have a different system of public safety in this country and actually have a system of public safety in this country, which of course we could call a safety net, which of course we could call dignified communities. I mean, we could call it whatever you want. I don't care if you call it defund the police. I really don't. Um, but ultimately, this idea that is being considered as so radical right now, um, I believe deeply in my soul is going to be um, not considered that radical 40 years from now. And I'm excited to be alive for that moment because anybody that knows me knows that I keep receipts. <laughs> in fact, I feel like I am a Dewey Decimal System of receipts. And I cannot wait for that moment where we say, gosh, remember when uh, human dignity and safety for everybody was such a radical idea. And so that's what I'm sitting with now, in addition to all of the things that George just offered, which I 100% co-sign. Thank you both. You, you essentially so eloquently told us that we both stand on the shoulder of giants and we are the ones that we are we have been waiting for. Um, and you know that we have had, that's George, that these discursive, right, victories and what Alicia's named is how do we then translate them in 40 years from now into a vision that is that is actualizable. That is our challenge today. So that takes me to my second question, which is, in your book, Alicia, you talk about the need to treat our work as hospice care for that which is dying and prenatal care for that which is being born. So how do we, in this moment of trying to, to turn discursive victories into actual real life changes, how do we both do both of these things at once? We need to defend and protect people, sustain people, and still yet transform into that 40 year vision. Mm -hmm. What is what is your advice to everyone here who's so with you on these visions that you're putting up? 
Well, I don't know if I'm in a position to give advice. I will say um, the things that I have been holding and the reason that I um, included that in my book is that I, I honestly feel that we are moving into a period that we get to shape. And in order for us to shape it in such a way that we advance and not just run ourselves around in circles, uh, I think it requires us to really dig into what are the things that need to die away without intervention, right? So, so much of what we're grappling with right now, all of these reckonings that are happening, whether it be around race or whether it be around climate or migration or war uh, or policing, right? All of these things, um, there is an impetus, right? To try to resuscitate <laughs> things that are not sustainable, things that do not serve us and to tinker around the edges of making it a little bit more smooth as opposed to being courageous enough to say, this has to die, this has to die. And the centerpiece of hospice care is not intervention. And so I want to be thinking about our work. What are the things that that, need, that cannot be, what are the things that need to pass away that we will not intervene in the dying process? And how do we communicate that, right? And organize around that? Because I, I think so much of this stuff is still contested around what actually does need to die away. Um, and, you know, true to form in America, we are um, not great at dealing with death and dying. And in fact, we, uh, you know, we call death and dying all kinds of names beyond the ones that they are. And we do the same with systems. And so for me, it's about getting clear about what needs to die and not be intervene, not intervene in the dying process. But then the other piece of it, frankly, and George spoke to this a little bit in his opening comments, is what are the things that we are investing in that are not yet born, but they will be at some point? And what do we want them to look like when they are? And what is the, sorry to take this metaphor maybe too far, but what is going to be our parenting style? Right? Like I, I think about that in the same way that I think about governance. And I think part of what we're trying to land on here is, you know, we're at this crossroads where yes, there are things that are dying away, but there are also things that are ready to sprout. And we need to be able to shepherd those things into being and also take ownership of them. And it is the muscle that I think is weakest in our movement, frankly, like all of us come into this work having a deep sense of what needs to go away. And we have to build the muscle of being able to continue to articulate what are we building? What are we bringing forward? And that is actually what we organize people around. It is what gets people out of bed every single day, knowing that there's something that they can't yet see, but they can feel it sensorily. That is what motivates people and moves people towards change. So George, these are some very small and simple themes, political death, rebirth, and then growth. Um, how do you see the cycle and how we move it forward? Oh, good Lord. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, I think we're in a hell of a moment. And I think what Alicia talked about in her opening comments, it's like that we are in the process of becoming America. I think it's actually happening right now in like really beautiful and profound ways. And I just think alone the, both the, uh, reaction to the murder of George Floyd and, and just as importantly the reaction to the protests in response to the murder of George Floyd were much different than they were uh, following Ferguson and I feel like we're seeing signs of awakening happening with huge parts of the population in the country um, so I think we're like deep in the most potent moment in in U.S. history of becoming America and uh, um and I think it's going to constantly be met with backlash, and we know that. And so I think we have to be able to be very clear on the moments where we are having big breakthroughs and that we are on the path of becoming an America that's truly reckoned with its history of racism and genocide. And we have to figure out how we pull as many people along for that ride as possible uh, and get to the other side with more grace and less carnage than we might otherwise. 
And uh, I think it's going to require a different kind of fighting. Like, I think I come out of a history of like going toe to toe with the banks and big corporations and doing a lot of direct action. And I still think all of that is, is critical and needed now more than ever. But I think to win the project of becoming America, it's going to require a different kind of organizing that really goes out and tries to connect with a lot of people that don't see themselves as part of our movement, that aren't connected to the left or to progressives or to organizing and helping make meaning of the changes in the country, the changes to our economics, our demographics, and whatnot. And that's a different kind of organizing than I think a lot of us are groomed for. But I think if we could figure that out, I think we're gonna we're gonna win a lot more stuff when we get to the other side with a lot more grace and beauty. You make me think, George, about Vincent Harding's question: Is America possible? And you imply that we are in fact trying to answer that right now. Uh, and you flag the need for grace, right? In that process of letting something die and getting to the other side to make it as gentle a death as possible. That's what I'm sort of pulling from here. So, but you also note that we need a, 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 or a type of organizing that is meaning making, right? We need to create meaning that is a, a refounding of the country. What are those elements that as organizers we need to engage, I ask you both, to create that kind of meaning when we're not just fighting, we're actually, and not even just building, but we're actually founding something new? You know, I'll start. <laughs> um, and I'm gonna start by uh, lifting up George's better half. You'll appreciate that, George. <laughs> uh, Jen Poo, um, who I've had the honor of working with for, God, well, almost two decades now. So there's that on that. And, you know, I, Jen, I think is somebody in my life who has really made me believe that, yes, we can become the America that we have been promised. And that that ability to do that is actually in our hands. And I was somebody who I realized after, you know, knowing iGen and really letting her organize me, which is no small feat. Um, I realized that so much of how I had been in this work for so long was from a place of not believing that change was possible. And how ironic is it to be uh, <laughs> in this work of change every single day, but not actually believe in it. And it, it, it made me think a lot differently about then what is required of us to make America possible. And for me, so much of that is both based in the things that George just talked about in terms of um, expanding how we understand who we need to be in this moment, but also expanding how we understand who is the we. And it is a question that I think our movements are frankly too ambivalent about. Um, I talk about this in the book too, that I think after 20 years of doing this work, my most successful campaigns <laughs> were the ones that brought people together that nobody ever thought would be on the same side. And it, it, that is what influences how I think about who we need to be now, but it also influences how I think about how we become the we that we need to be. And so much of that, I think, is about really focusing, again, on uprooting the cynicism that I think lives inside of all of us and replacing that cynicism with innovation and creativity. Honestly and truly, to be able to believe that America is possible means that we have to become different kinds of architects. And if we're not the kind of people that can not only craft and shape when we're not totally sure what the finished product is gonna be and bring people along for that process and dive into the places where people have been left out and left behind, not just by rigged rules, but by our movements, um, if we can't do that, I agree with George 100%, we won't be able to make America possible. But if we can do that, then we will take our rightful place in history as 
the architects of what America was supposed to be in the damn first place. George, I, I encourage you to follow up on that and tell us how I don't even to remember make meaning in America possible. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, you know, Vincent Harding also said, like, I'm a citizen of a country that does not yet exist, a, a country we still have to create. And I think, like, clearly we're in that project. I think, I mean, I really think about rights and democracy as an organization that's based in two uh, states that have big rural populations, have a lot of white folks in it. And I think rights and democracy has a really critical role to play in creating a model for other folks in the country. And, and uh, just to be upfront, like I feel like somebody's got to figure out how we're going to organize some of the struggling white folks in this country to be part of the project of becoming America, because we don't organize them, then we've learned the hard way somebody else is going to do it. And uh, I was just saying that I think like, on the left, we we tend to like not be that sophisticated when we think about white folks. Like, and I think of their, we have really four white economies in the US. Like I would say one being the 1% or just folks that are doing really, really well uh, to say the least. And then there's still ascending white folks of which they're from the systems of capitalism and racism. Um, and uh, those folks range from really progressive to conservative. And then the two categories I think we have to think about how we're organizing better is the third category I would call the fallen people that we maybe used to call the white working class or even the middle class who've really fallen from grace. A lot of those union jobs and other things that help move people into the working and middle class they're not they're not a thing anymore. Um, and what's and that's you know one of the 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 classes of white folks I come from. Uh, those aren't people that really built a lot of durable wealth. It was really able to wipe it out in a generation or two. And then we never talk about the 18 million uh, white folks that live in poverty. And I think to build the movement that's gonna become America, we have to decide how we're gonna engage some of these folks in the categories I would call the fallen and, the, and among the forgotten. Um, but how we do it matters. And there are some folks that say we can go get the white people by, by like dodging race, dodging immigration, speaking to the lowest common denominator, and you know, my answer to that is we've tried that for the last 40 years and here we are. Um, and then the second would be to write those folks off, which I think is just actually both, I, I question from a moral perspective and from a strategy perspective. There are 60 million folks in the country that live in rural communities. I don't wanna give the other side a 60 million person lead. I'm not willing to do that, but whatever we do, it has to be race conscious, multiracial organizing. And I think if we do that and we engage in that, we double down on it going to bring a lot more people along for the ride of becoming America. Thank you, George. And you touched on a, a question that I was actually just about to read my mind. I lean into how does how does a state like uh, organizing in states like Vermont and New Hampshire fit in small states with white rural populations? So I'm going to ask you to touch on the, the same thing, Alicia. Um, it, George, has noted that we have done two, two, one of two things over and over again, expecting a different result and we know what that means, right? Either pitching to the lowest common denominator or writing people off. What does the alternative look like? What does it mean in rural white areas to do race conscious organizing? And what does that look like to you from someone who's been deeply embedded uh, in the racial justice movement and in black communities? Okay, Kathy, come on and ask the hard questions now. <laughs> you answered all the easy ones without even <laughs> breaking a sweat. <laughs> uh, okay, well, I'm sweating now. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's the thing. Let me let me start from a different premise. Um, rural communities, and George has taught me this, rural communities are comprised of Black people too. Black folks and white folks and, and Latinx folks and Asian folks, like folks live in community together. And I, I think one of the big challenges that we have is that we don't, we kind of don't know our country. <laughs> and I think what George is asking us to do is be a non-colonizing explorer. And so for me, what that makes me know, right, is that so much of how we talk about communities that have been left out and left behind, we assign urban communities to black folk, right? And we assign rural communities to white folk, as opposed to trying to dig underneath that and say, 
where are people living and why? What is the state of their lives? What are the things that they long for? And how can we figure out how to connect them in our movements, knowing that there are millions of people out there for whom they are unhappy with the state of the quality of their life. And as George said, there are other people getting to them first because we have left a lot on the table. And that is not just true about white folks, right? That's a true about rural communities, as George said. And it's definitely true about black folks. George and I have talked about this a ton and I feel like, you know, <laughs> we're always on these endless, it's now endless Zoom calls before it was endless meetings, you know, being on planes, trains and buses, and automobiles. <laughs> but, and you know, we're like high-fiving each other under the table because you have to keep making these interventions that organizing is a science and it's an art. And part of the science of organizing is knowing your folks <laughs> and it's knowing where your people are. It's understanding what they care about and it's understanding what moves them. But the other part of it is really understanding the art of how it is that we bring together all of these people from different experiences, different backgrounds with a common interest for change. And for me, I'm focused on building power in black communities and building um, a powerful part of the multiracial movement for a multiracial democracy, black folks have to be a critical piece of that. And I have chosen to take on this question of how do we make black folks more powerful in that coalition so that there can be a coalition. And I think George similarly has taken on this question of, well, how do we take on what is keeping white folks from being a part of a multiracial movement for a multiracial democracy. And it is only once we have unlocked that, that we can, we can actually build the movement that we need to be. And I, I underscore and underline that because I, I wonder if sometimes we start from the wrong place, <laughs> right? I wonder if sometimes we start from the wrong place as opposed to starting from here's where we're ultimately trying to go, and here's what it's gonna to take to get us there. Um, I think, and what I know from all of my relatives that live in rural communities, is that people are already in relationship to each other. They are already working in the same places, they're eating at the same restaurants, they're you know exchanging cups of flour and sugar, right? That is already happening, but what is intervening is the stories that they see on television, the stories that they hear in their car on the way to the gatherings that they're they're having right now, that are about why we why we shouldn't do what we're already doing. They're about how, you know, one of us is taking something that somebody else deserves. And we haven't figured out as a movement how to honestly and truthfully intervene in that. So much of what we do is say, don't say that. That's mean. <laughs> And that's not actually giving people a, a sense of why it's happening. And it's also not giving people a sense of who's to blame. And if we don't replace, if we don't replace the story of who's to blame with corporate power, right? And, and the failed project of, of white supremacy, um, then that leaves a lot of room for people to put all kinds of other stuff in there. So for me, um, what, how our liberation is tied to each other, frankly, is the same as what's the strategy for us to get there. And what I know is that if we are going to be powerful together, we one, need to strengthen our troops and our forces. You can't go to battle without an army. And I think about this a lot when it comes to black folks, I'm like, yo, they're coming for us but we are not on the same page about what needs to get done. <laughs> I know George is just like, okay, rural folks, they're coming for us, but we are not on the same page about what needs to be done. Once we've made some advances there, we can actually be so powerful together, but it requires, um, it requires a both and, in my opinion. I hope that made sense, Kathy, and I'm still sorry. Almost too much sense. It was extraordinary. Um, the, I mean, what you, I love that you keep naming how you and George learn from each other. And at the same time, you know that we don't even know our own damn country. 
Mm. And what, what that says to me is you two are modeling something that we need to spread around. How do we become a, a learning, like we talk about learning organizations, how do we become a learning country, right? Where we learn from each other as well as learn about each other. And how do we parlay that? And it's gonna be my last question for you both because you have named the power of cultural narratives, right? And how currently it sort of shrinks what is, shrinks the parameters of the possible. They, they talk about uh, the power of being able to define reality as one of the highest forms of power and have other people respond as such. How do we do our work in this space you just named, uh, the space of cultural narrative? How do we learn from each other so that we build that power to define reality and have especially our vision of multiracial democracy and have others respond as such. I'll leave this as my last question because I could talk to y'all till midnight, but our time is up. So take it home with that really, really important question. And I assure you everyone here will take it to heart and, and hold it and, and take it into their work. Alicia, I'll go and then you can like I do, I think like you the book out of your own country, damn it. Um, <laughs> Like it's you, know, you don't write it. I want to write it. Like uh, well done. <laughs> uh, write just, it together. Uh, you could write it together. Yeah, what a piece that would yeah, be. It'd be yeah, a lot of beat the endless meetings and Zoom calls. Um, <laughs> and then just to say what you know, what I love about your book is uh, it's a book about organizing. Really, I feel like there's other books you could have written and maybe even might have been more you know like sold more books, but you wrote the book you wanted. It's about organizing, about meeting making, about strategy, um, and uh, I told you the other day, I'm like, I was like, man, you were paying way better attention to MTV than I was because you were, you were waking through MTV and I was like, like, damn, whip it. That is a cool song. Um, so, um, I just say this, I think like Kathy, like, it's like, like what Alicia was hitting on. It's like, regardless of race, it's like good organizing. We start where people are at and uh, we don't judge people by where they start. It's about where they might end up in the journey of organizing that matters most. And like the starting point's different for everybody. Um, but at least it's something you said in a call the other day, like, you know, I can organize black progressives or I can organize black the black community to be more progressive. And like that is hung with me big. And I feel like we're trying to do that in rural communities. So I just think we got to get back to an organizing that starts where people are at, um, recognizes people's pain, but has every intention of moving people along a meaning making journey that makes people more woke along the way. And uh, and we know how to do that organizing. I think we just kind of got to get back to it. Oh yeah, oh yeah, George. I agree, as per usual, 100%. And there's a couple of things that I've been noodling on recently that, you know, bear with me, they're not fully formed, but it's this is my gut, it's my gut instinct. You know, the stories, that we tell each other and that we are told um, completely shape our lives. And they don't just shape our lives, but they shape the rules that govern our lives. And I do, I talk about this in the book in the sense that, you know, the way that we make meaning of what's happening around us um, is an arena that we can control. And as I was coming up in organizing work, I was always taught that, you know, implicitly most but sometimes explicitly, I was always taught that the culture work is like the soft, fluffy, non-work. <laughs> and really, you had to be material. You had to do the political organizing because nobody cared about culture. And I was the jerk that was like, I care about culture. I care a lot about pop culture. It's how I make meaning of the world. It's how I started to understand politics. And frankly, it's how I connect with people out on the doors <laughs> because nobody, unfortunately, Nobody wants to talk to me about Gramsci. People want to talk to me about Real Housewives of Atlanta. And so I have to, able, have to actually be able to speak many different languages at once. So for me, I, I think we just cannot leave that arena uncontested. And as I've said a couple of times now, I think we are entering a new period of culture wars. And there is a fight to make sense of who we are as a nation and who we can be. And it would be a grave error 
for our movements to leave anything else on the table for the other side to devour. And I can tell you, it is a place that we are losing, 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 losing. How do I know that? <laughs> because I spend way too much time on social media. And unfortunately, everybody's opinions that they have about Black Lives Matter or defund the police or even just me myself, <laughs> they tag me in. So I read everything, even though I don't respond. <laughs> and I will tell you that the narratives that carry and have carried in this period, and it's been 10 years, is that the radical socialist liberals, which is so frustrating to me because I believe words mean things and there's no such thing as that. But anyway, <laughs> radical socialist liberals are coming to take everything that you've worked so hard for. And especially those BLM people, they are coming to take your stuff. We haven't figured out what stuff yet, but we're coming apparently to take your stuff. And so that is why white people need to take up arms and defend themselves and defend their stuff. That is the narrative that is holding right now. And I think that we have to actually take up this work. I love to ignore things like that, but I can tell you that it is proliferating at like mushroom speed because of the internet and because of social media and because of algorithms and because of corporate power. <laughs> Literally, they have built vehicles to disseminate messages and frames and worldviews at warp speed. And we have to contest with that. We do not have a choice. Lastly, I will say here, um, for me, I really feel that part of how we get in that space is start to interrupt the fairy tales that we tell each other <laughs> and ourselves about change and how it happens, about who we are, about how big we are, about how many people we've touched, right? Like, I'm not for, uh, and I'm just going to say this, and sorry, that I am who I am. I am not for Joe Biden's campaign of reconciliation because it, it, it doesn't have a truth component. And that's the whole model. You have to tell the truth in order for people to come back together again. So why don't we start with us? Let's tell new stories about how change happens and about who are the superheroes of this moment. And our work is about helping every single person in this country see that they can be the superhero in their own story. And we can do that from a number of different angles, but we have to commit ourselves to it. So that I think is our task right now. Wow. Well, I, I was on a meeting the other day when someone literally said, tell the truth and shame the devil. So some mm -hmm. things do not, they are eternal, right? Mm -hmm. That's true. Um, and, and some of the, the profound advice both of you are giving us um, is in fact eternal. Don't leave anything on the table. Don't let them be 60 million ahead. We cannot be too so precious that we don't do our work in the way that we need to do it because uh, we are building a new narrative for multiracial democracy. And I cannot thank you both enough as being two of our leaders in this space, modeling for us, teaching us, we love your book, Alicia. We love your organization, George. We are profoundly grateful to the two of you. And I am so privileged and honored to have been part of this conversation tonight. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, Kathy. Great questions. Wow. What an incredible conversation. Uh, it was just, a, I was there back at the end of 2020 when we had that interview live at our Human Rights Ward, and it was such a privilege to spend some time with Kathy and Alicia and George. So I'm glad we got to re-air it. And now I would like to introduce some of the members of our Rights and Democracy Institute Movement Reading Group. So tonight I'm joined by Esma Elhouni, Mia Schultz, and Zariah Hightower. Esma serves as our New Hampshire Movement Politics Director. Mia is a former board member and now our RDI Catalyst Leadership Coordinator. And Zariah is a city councilor for Burlington, Vermont. And we've all been reading Alicia's book, The Purpose of Power. And I can't wait to hear some of the lessons and insights that 
you all have gleaned from this incredible book, um, I can speak for myself that it's just been just mind blowing all the lessons that she has packed into these, into these pages. So um, I'd love to start off the conversation with you, Esma, and just hear about what connections you've made, um, you know, since like the beginning of the Black Lives Matter movement and your own work uh, and whether or not there were any similarities. Yeah, thank you so much for your question. Also sharing that powerful interview with uh, Alicia Garza and George Goal that we hosted um, as Rights and Democracy. Um, yeah, before moving to what we, we call New England, which is really uh, a Binicky land, I lived in Georgia and I was an organizer there. Um, I was a part of different organizing efforts um, around policing, immigration, gentrification, and also Islamophobia. Um, there was a lot of uh, policing that was affecting our communities, especially the Black community, where there were several unarmed Black uh, people, both men, women, but also unarmed non-binary uh, white folks who were killed uh, by the hands of law enforcement. Um, there was another kind of death, one that isn't necessarily seen as um, death in a traditional sense, that involved um, uh, basically a dying of a culture a dying of a black community who were being uprooted essentially from their homes. Um, we know it as gentrification. Um, I think it was in that organizing that probably um, where I learned my greatest lessons. Uh, I was a student at Georgia State University and black residents were appealing to us to join their campaign to stop our school from gentrifying their neighborhoods and displacing you know, the predominantly black residents living there. Um, and there were issues that arose between the students and the black elders who were being gentrified, right? Um, the students, which included uh, many black students did not always see eye to eye on all issues um, with the black residents um, who were being displaced. And it was very clear how easy it was to just fight and not get anything done. Um, so I was focused on the wishes of the residents while there were some students who um, wanted to focus on other issues that came up that were important. Um, but nothing to do with um, the campaign at the time. So um, instead of focusing on where everyone agreed, which was um, the school, our school, should have a community benefits agreement with the community where our school was developing in, so-called developing in. Um, so many of the students wanted to focus on things we didn't necessarily need to at the time. Um, so there were definitely disagreements in worldview. And Alicia Garza talks about being able to organize with different people in her in the book. Um, and I remember her saying that in order to have a movement, you need at least 10% of the population, right? So if we're talking about in the US, there's about how many 300 million people in the US at least. So there's no way we're going to get, um, I don't know, 10 million, I don't know how, whichever is like 10% of 300 million, whatever that number is. Uh, to see eye to eye on everything. There's just no way, right? So for 10, to, for 10 million people to see everything the same, right? It's impossible. So um, what does that mean when we really need changes for our community now? Um, well, that means we're gonna have to organize with people we don't always see eye to eye with um, and that not compromise. And uh, I don't, at least I don't see that as compromising on the backs of people, right? You're still holding your values. You're still holding your stance. Um, like, for example, for me, I'll always be organizing through a, a military industrial complex abolitionist lens, which includes abolition of police, includes the abolition of jails, um, but not everyone I organize with will agree with me. And when I'm organizing uh, around, for example, workers' rights, I'll be in spaces with people who don't uh, agree with police abolition, but that's okay. The goal is to raise the wage, right? We don't need to have the... Uh, the fact that you're not a police or prison abolitionist a deciding factor of whether I'm going to organize with you. So um, when Alicia Garcia said she organized with people who did not see eye to eye with her, that resonated with me. Um, and we could still hold onto our values without compromising them the slightest um, and be in spaces with others who don't um, necessarily agree with us on particular issue, but agree like here on this issue at hand. Incredible. Yeah, I love that you took us there. Asma is just so important that we don't have to water down our point of view 
and, and kind of compromise our values or make us any less radical in order to get where we want to go in coalition with people that we do share certain values with, we can still win on those issues without having to water it down what, we're, what we do believe. And, and that's so, so key. I love that you highlighted that. Um, I'm wondering, Mia or Zariah, this first question, just like, you know, general reflections from the, this book, um, you know, what connections you were making between the beginning of the Black Lives Matter movement and, and any work that you've been doing, you know, in the past 10 plus years and any similarities that you saw there? Mia or Zariah, whoever wants to start. Sure, thank you, first of all, for having, having us on this program and, and talking about this great book. You know, um, there's a lot of parallels that I find with Alicia and, and her movement and her and the way that she's, you know, developed and grown. Um, we're not too uh, different in age. And so where we came from um, really is a lot, we parallel a lot, but when I wanted to like kind of jump in on what As Esma was saying, which was, you know, about what Alicia was saying, you know, basically conflict is inevitable. Alicia says that it's natural and it's needed. Those are Alicia's words, you know, and, and that brings me to my own organizing in terms of, you know, I, I know a lot of my organizing comes from a place of trauma, mm -hmm. um, of things that have happened to me in my life that have happened to my children in my life. And Sometimes we, be, we can get reactionary and angry and things like that. And we might think that the other person who can't quite see where we're coming from is bad. And they're not bad. They just don't know what we know and what we experience. Mm -hmm. And if we can somehow step outside of our trauma for a moment and realize that we're all humans and that we just need to push them in this conflict, it's uncomfortable. Like, having those like people throw around we I'm ready to have uncomfortable conversations like it's really uncomfortable but it's inevitable and it's needed and as Alicia just said in in this this what she was speaking about is that you know um we have to sit into that discomfort in order to make change because it's like that whole unlearning thing that she talks about in her book we're unlearning um, you know, the, being comfortable in these systems that oppress us. And, and so, so I really like, in my own personal growth, have found that to be something that I draw upon when I'm like ready to just spew out, like, you don't understand me and you must be, um, you know, a terrible person. And really it's just, they just don't know our experiences and we just need to enlighten them and that this is a part of the natural progression of change. Um, mm -hmm. so. Yeah, yeah, I love that. The need for trauma-informed practices within our organizing spaces and understanding how trauma impacts and gets in the way of us, our ability to connect with each other, not just people who are like us, but people who are different and like, if we don't have any kind of, if that's not informing how we're approaching our work, then we're just gonna be re-traumatizing people when we try to talk to them about the things that matter to us or matters to them. So we have to really be sensitive around that. Thanks for bringing us there, Mia. Yeah. So Zurai, I wanna give you a chance just to introduce yourself. And if you'd like, you can jump in about the book or just talk about you know, what you saw in the interview this first question here was just, you know, connections that you make between the beginning of the Black Lives Matter movement and, and your own work in the past 10 plus years and any similarities you've seen there. Love for you to have a chance to introduce yourself and speak a bit about that. Yeah, thanks. So Zariah Hightower has mentioned, um, city councilor and RDI board member. And I, I have not read the book, I'm honest. I'm just finishing up cast, um, which is its own kind of amazingness. Um, but yeah, I think the, I don't, it, I feel like I had a slightly different start in terms of, I didn't come from an activist background originally. I grew up um, in a somewhat conservative community, um, both, <laughs> for, both for black folks and white folks. And so um, I think I 
I joined, I became an environmentalist and that's kind of the way that I came through activism. And I went to an undergraduate school in Oklahoma um, that was mostly oil and gas. And there were, you know, like five environmental majors. And so I was just like, okay, all these people like, just don't get it, it's fine. And then I went to grad school with 200, with 200 environmentalists. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. We all agree on everything. And so I started from that assumption of like, oh, as long as we kind of agree on these like baseline environmental things and surely we agree on everything. And it was kind of the Black Lives Matter movement that um, started to show me that that wasn't true and that me going you know, to this predominantly white Ivy League school that there were a lot of differences and um, those was manifested in a lot of ways. I remember the first one was one of my friends who was helping organize one of the marches, um, a white woman um, you know, like she was still organizing one of the marches and we were talking about running and I was like, oh yeah, I really like this one route. And she was like, oh, that goes through like kind of a shady neighborhood, aren't you scared? And I was like, what is she talking about? Cause it went through, a, you know, like a nice, well taken care of neighborhood but it was predominantly black and brown. And so just like the person, I think, so for me it was almost, <laughs> I think I started with this assumption of everybody agreed with me and slowly in my life have come to learn that um, there's just fundamental, I guess, like differences and truths about certain beliefs. Um, and also, yeah, and some of it is also me learning from other folks that there's some fundamental things that I've been doing wrong and how I've been thinking wrong. So, um, so I think it doesn't, I think I kind of take it for granted that I'm gonna have to work with people <laughs> who I don't necessarily agree with. Mm. Love that, yeah. That's really great. I hadn't heard that sort of background from you, Zariah, and I, I kind of have a similar story and that I kind of came to this moment initially through the door of the environmental movement and that kind of from there became kind of op awakened to how it was a political and economic sort of issue. Environmental issues kind of ha had roots in a lot bigger, deeper stuff. So um, yeah, really interesting um, to have that to, to have that in common. Um, so I'm going to move on to the next question here, which is just, um, I think some of you have sort of touched on this a little bit already, um, but just how the BLM movement has impacted your own community, um, how you've seen, you know, since Black Lives Matter really has started to, you know, make splashes and waves in, in the media and become more of a thing in people's public consciousness, how, you, how you've seen that played out uh, where you live um, or different places where you've lived in the past, you know, 10 plus years. Um, whoever wants to start, I'll just leave the floor open. I'll start since I went last, last time, um, give everybody else a chance to think a little bit more. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about Burlington because I think, and this is something I talk a lot about narratives just because I realize how much my narratives have changed. Um, over my own kind of lifetime, but I think that's also true kind of going back to the interview for America's, we've just had, like America started with the narrative of black lives don't matter. And um, that has been codified and rewritten in a million different ways over hundreds of years. And so I think the black lives matter movement has impacted my community more than anything in giving us a different narrative especially in Vermont where, you know, it's, a, it's, it's still a small black community. We're there, we are here, <laughs> do not get us wrong, we are here. But um, it's small and having a national movement to have, to pull all of these narratives from, to, be, to really counter the narratives that we've been telling ourselves as all of us as Americans for hundreds of years um, is really powerful for the black community. And it's also really powerful for allies um, in terms of understanding and having having a different story to reach to when you're in those political moments, when you're in those personal moments. And I think that's been just tremendously powerful for all of us. Mm, yes, yes, amazing shared narrative that reframes. Yes, incredible. All right, so Esma or Mia, um, same question, you know, can you describe how the, the BLM movement, how you've seen its impact in your, your local community? I'll, I'll comment on that. Um, 
So in Bennington, there's kind of a, a cultural um, understanding that you really don't speak up, especially if you're a person of color, because it can turn into being a target, you're not believed, and there's there's just you know a, a wide array of why people it's cultural, right? We, we we've been given all of the cues on why we shouldn't speak up. Um, when Black Lives, when George Floyd and Black Lives Matter mo moment came about, um, I saw people of color stand up and say, you know what, I don't really care anymore. <laughs> you know, they um, they felt, you know, not only awakened by you know watching yet again the murder of a, a unarmed black man on television, you know, right before our eyes, you know, and just tired. But they also felt like this collective um, appreciation for that from white folks, honestly. Like they, they're like, oh, white folks finally said, hey, I want to hear your stories. Um, and so there was this awakening for an um, almost approval from, from white folks to say, you know, we want to hear what's going on in the Black community. We had no idea. Um, and George Floyd awakened that and the Black Lives Matter movement here in town. But it also aw awakened a whole nother element. And so that is the element of hate. Um, and they were more emboldened. And we know that they were have been more emboldened in the last few years. Um, anyway, so now we add, you know, this whole Black Lives Matter um, movement and defund the defund the police and all of that. And those, um, you know, that hate came out. And so in our own town, we saw, you know, this, this di divisive like struggle literally on the street. When we tried to do a, a, a mural, when they tried to paint a mural in the road to say Black Lives Matter, the, the opposition was literally laying in the ground trying to prevent us from doing that. Um, but we really saw also this element of community, right? Like of white people stepping up and listening to, uh, to black and brown folks and saying, you know, we believe you and we will fight these, this insidious, hateful people who are trying to prevent, you know, just saying that you matter. Um, so it's really like, um, you know, embracing, they were embracing conflict for us and that was really profound for me. Hmm. Wow. Wow, that's really cool to hear that story from Bennington. And I think that that's really what social movements are about, right? It's about creating these opportunities for, for people to act, to, for people to have to make a decision. Am I, do I support this or do I not support this? And it's like, it, it makes, it makes it so that it has to be visible, things that were not talked about, things that were invisible to certain people because of you know, willful ignorance, because of deliberate ignorance. And so that's like why it's so important that, that, these, um, that these social movements, that they, they don't go quietly, that they actually have a, a really strong presence and they make a lot of noise. Esma, what about you? How have you seen the BLM movement impact your community where you live? Or you said you you've lived in lots of different spots. It sounds like in the yeah. country. So, <laughs> yeah. So you can, anywhere. <laughs> now, when you ask that question, I'm like community. Hmm. And automatically, mm -hmm. I'm gonna go to the community that I'm oftentimes most I identified with, which is the Muslim community, because when I show up, that's the first thing people see, a Muslim woman. So I think that's where I go to. Um. So uh. So as a uh a person of color who is non-black. Um, as Alicia said so eloquently, as Zoraya um, uh, elaborated on and Mia elaborated on so beautifully, um, Black Lives Matter will protect all of us if we get behind it, right? So for me, I, you know, I can't speak for all Muslims, but I can say for me, Black Lives Matter said it's okay to be you. And it's okay to be you. I've learned that through watching Black organizers be themselves, right? Um, that to be non-white is still beautiful, right? Contrary to the normative culture that teaches us otherwise, right? Um, to be non-conforming in our culture is okay. And it's actually valuable to the United States because we contribute different beautiful things and that's beneficial to our communities, right? 
to be ourselves is exactly what this nation actually really needs from us. And to continue to conform is to continue to accept the unjust systems that we know are not doing good by us. So Black Lives Matter um, taught and continues to teach me that we can't leave people behind. And for too long, it's the Black community that's getting the shorter end of the stick. So my liberation is bound to the liberation of Black folks in this country. So that's what I have to say about the Black Lives Matter. I'm indebted to it. Mm, beautiful. I love that. So I, I think let's just kind of jump into the next question. Um, I want to hear about people's reactions in the book. Garja talks about how she's spent a, a career learning and unlearning some really hard truths about organizing. And I, I guess I want to hear folks take away from this. Um, you know, did you find that this book has reinforced your truths around organizing in our communities? Um, yeah, what are your takeaways around uh, just Garja's talk around learning and unlearning? Well, you know, um, yeah, learning is, is learning and unlearning is a is a process that you go through throughout life. Like it's not ever ending. And if you if you don't if you stop, then I don't know what you're doing with life. <laughs> You have to learn and unlearn some of the things that hold us back and um, and learn the things that keep us together. And it's about developing relationships with one another, real relationships, meaningful ones um, that that collectively put us together to push forward what we need to push forward. And that is a process that we go through together. That's my take on it. Wonderful. Asma, can I jump next to you? Just because before we started the interview, you were talking about you know the need to unlearn white supremacy, unlearn patriarchy, unlearn capitalism. Yeah. You know how that's something that a project that's lifelong, and you don't have to speak. You know you don't have to specifically speak to that, but I think you've got some great points around there. Um, yeah, I uh, so I'm gonna really personalize this, and I know a lot of people are not gonna share this. But so this is a very personal um, answer just in my life. Um, I think the book highlights for me the need to organize from a place of faith um, because many of the lessons in organizing, especially in the book, are in line with, um, with faith, at least my Islamic faith. Um, and the things I've heard about from other faiths, you know, um, speak to the way I need to be moving in spaces. So the restorative, the transformative justice aspects versus punitive, right? Um, that's very much in line with faith and also the ability to meet people where they are and then moving people along to see, um, you know, the inequities plague all of our communities. But oftentimes religion is seen as like this personal thing and it could be, um, an introspection is important and has its place, but also faith calls us to change systems. And that's an area many faith groups are too afraid to remind people of, um, but it's front and center in, in my mind. So I think it's unlearning to stop throwing valuable lessons from uh, my beautiful faith, because I think we live in a society where, um, and, and for good reasons, um, you know, faith is looked down upon because of some of the historical context that it's, you know, it left people behind. It's um, done some pretty awful things, but but also um, the beauty in faith and, and like we shouldn't forget that um, faith is also a tool for many beautiful things. So that's really a, a personal thing for, for just like me. But I wanted to share because um, I do do this from a place of faith. So like, that's kind of like my answer. What I'm, I'm unlearning is to trust my, um, my, my gut instinct about, you know, my faith t teaches me to do this and that, um, particularly around restorative and transformative justice. Hmm. Beautiful. I always appreciate when you bring that into our, our movement spaces, Asma. So thanks for sharing that today. Uh, Zariah, what about you? Any kind of like things coming up for you around just like lessons that you've had to unlearn slash learn uh, when it comes to this kind of work? Yeah, I mean, definitely I think the individual work of white supremacy, classism, um, 
patriarchy. Um, I also work in international development. So colonialism, neo-colonialism, I mean, that's just been, I think, a constant process of, um, I think, especially unlearning, but then also learning. I think organizing has definitely been, um, like, I'm not sure that anything that I believed <laughs> three years ago, I believe now, and anything that I believe now, I believe, I think that that's constantly like a back and forth in terms of like an internal battle of like, I don't know what's right. Um, and so I think organizing is definitely, it's tough because it gets so like, I think with things like white supremacy, it's just so clear like what, like the direction that we need to go and then just like seeing it in yourself and seeing in other people and being like, okay, like that's something that we can grow from, like that we should leave behind. Whereas organizing, it's like some of the things it's like, you know, I guess fundamentally, I still believe that a movement takes, you know, to the like all kinds and starting out environmental organizing, like how do you, you know, take the green pieces with the ones that work with corporations to make them better. And surely all of those things are a good thing, but I do, and that is something I think that has been my most consistent belief, but I also feel like there's moments where like you like you can't always compromise. Like there have to be some things like that, like you do have to as a movement say together, here are some core principles. It doesn't matter if you can move it this tiny little incremental step, there is some increments that are too small that we're or that aren't steps at all that we're not willing to take. And so um I think. Yeah, so I think organizing is a little bit harder to me because there's just so many, so many different situations where one thing that is a hard truth every time and another one changes. But so I think that's two very different kinds of learning and unlearning for me is kind of the personal, or I guess even, I don't even know what that is, but the, the yeah, the kind of fundamental things versus the like, what do you do as an organizer and what does that look like? Mm. Nice. Yeah, that reminds me of, I think it was Mia, but it might have been Asma who said earlier just about, um, you know, how we have to, we, we don't want to be compromising in our values and our, our politics, but we still need to find a way to, to mend that and, and have that merge with trying to bring people in who aren't already 100% with us. Was that, was that Mia or was that Asma? Asma. I think it was both of us. I think it was all three of us. <laughs> all all of us said that. Every single one of us. <laughs> nice. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Great. Yeah. She really, she really gets to it there, guys. With just this, this phenomena that we're all experiencing collectively and individually about just like having to learn lessons of how to, how do we build this movement into something that's actually going to win us the victories that we need, and also unlearning. Uh, it's the lessons old lessons of like old ways of doing that that weren't working and unlearning all of these narratives like Zara I was talking about before unlearning the narrative um, that black lives don't matter that our country is constantly asserted for so long so incredible yeah thanks for thanks for everyone's remarks on all that so our last question it's 7 16 we're going to be trying to close pretty soon here so our last question is you know the title of the book the purpose of power. It's pretty, it's so moving. And I think really just kind of gets to the point uh, of what organizing is about. And I'm wondering if each of you wants to touch on um, a little bit about this idea of collective power. Uh, and, you know, what parts of the book um, guide you or just in your, you know, lessons as an organizer have guided you in understanding the purpose of our collective power of working to collectively? Um, and in what ways can we apply this idea to continuing to build our movement? So once again, I'm not going to pick on anyone to start. Whoever wants to take the floor first. Uh, I wonder if I should start just because I do want to like talk about power um, and the definition of power. Is that okay? Heck yes. Okay, yeah. So like, um, so people know, like organizers know the definition of power is the ability to act, right? And there's power over, um, there's power within, and then there's power with. And I think collective power is that power with people. So um, Alicia said, you know, we're all superpowers, right? We're all superpowers. Um, but we can't be superpowers without each other. So we, we got to remember that, like, we cannot be superpowers without each other. So it's not one hero. You know, it's not a one hero show that oftentimes we like 
to make people out to be in this country. We're all about heroes. This is a hero nation, right? We idolize heroes, but uh, it's, it's a superpower that we need to know that we each hold that is actually a part of a greater puzzle. So we're just a piece of this greater puzzle that we're working on together, right? Um, and um, I think our speaker in this uh, show calls it the project of America that we have yet, still yet to accomplish, right? Our, our, uh, uh, the, the principles that we would love to finally get to as a nation that we have yet to got, ha have gotten to, right? So we need, keep, we need to keep reminding people that really what's happening is corporations and white supremacy is the evil, not us. They're hurting all of us, black, brown, white, right? With white supremacy and corporate takeover is, you know, we, we are prioritizing money constantly. We are prioritizing profit constantly over people. So collective power is using individual power with, um, with other individual powers we, that we all have to come together for a real change. Um, and as Alicia says, you know, protests and rallies are good, but we also need policy changes. And sometimes protests and rallies get, there, get us there. You know, they get us to those policy changes, but so does voting. And so does getting involved um, through other forms of organizing if we can't vote. Right. So does writing. So does calling our representatives. Um, yeah. So collective power is finding uh, our individual power, whatever it looks like. If we were an artist, we're going to create art for the movement. If we're singers, we're going to sing and make people happy for the movement. You know, finding our individual power as part of this larger individual powers that come together for, um, you know, this transformative society that we all want to live in. So I think, yeah, that's kind of like what I have to say about it. Oh, I dig that so much. And I'm glad that you started there too, because I think that it's so important. There's so, honestly, with all the vocabulary that we have, everyone has their own definition, you know? And so it's, it's like, it seems like, well, before we start about, talk about values, well, like, well, we got to define those values first, you know? So I'm, I'm glad that you started there. And Mia or Zariah, um, you know, any, any thoughts coming up for you around just this concept of collective power um, and just how we can apply it to building the movement that we need. Great, yeah, I think it's really the, um, yeah, one doing with, and then, I mean, America is this, you know, experiment of capitalism and democracy that just, you know, went wrong <laughs> to some extent, and um, I think, I think we can still get it right, but I think we've got like some basics that, ugh, coming from a non-activist background, it's like once you get pulled into the stream, you can just see how many ways that's where it seemed insurmountable, like, oh, we can never fix this. And then you're like, wait, no, we know how to fix this. Like, we know, we know what we have to do. All we have to do is like, get the get the will of the people which who this benefits to like align with it and so I think um I think what we'll, I guess as I'm like reflecting on the interview and like what it means to like build America is we just need to be a country of activists and not like one activist or <laughs> 10 activists that we rally behind or 100 activists that we rally behind it's like everybody needs to be a little bit in the know and that sounds hard because there's so many things to be in the know about but at the same time like you build those just as an environmental activist it's like very quickly you start to then also be you know like a racial justice activist and you start to be an economic justice activist just because you those those they're they're not different they're like they start to be really combined and not every activist is going to be in every movement but i do think that if we just paid attention even a little bit and i'm speaking to the choir here not you but like if if folks who aren't in the movement just paid attention we would we would vote differently we would come out differently um so yeah i think that's what that collective power means is we know where we have to go and just getting there nice yeah i think it um i think bill mckibben maybe was the person I, I might be misquoting this, but he says something along the lines of we've won the argument, but we're going to lose the fight. And it's, it's so he's saying, like, if, unless we organize, unless we talk to each other and really just like use that collective power, use that and, and find a way to like, you know, make it function for us, then it, it doesn't matter if we're, we, we have ethics on our side or whatever, if, if we're right, you know, 
we have to we have to fight with our with our organizing kind of tool set um, in order to get where we need to go. Yeah. So Mia, can I can I have ask you to bring us home as just <laughs> <laughs> kind of just uh, jump in here and then we'll we'll bring it to a close. Great. Yeah, I can try. Um, you know, I want to just bring something deeply personal and something that I've you know, been going through now. I mean, when you talk about power, um, the black woman in Vermont, like <laughs> we're like the least amount of power in Vermont. And especially when it comes to protecting of our children. And so since I moved to Vermont, like that has been my, my aim because I found so many things happening to my children, including now. And so I'll bring this personal example into this moment um, so yeah, you know, my son was asked to, um, participate in role playing, um, that was, was racist and inappropriate. And I had to say something and, and as I like tried to, you know, nick at the teacher as a superintendent and say, you know, I need more details and I need to find out where you're going with this assignment. This feels bad. This feels racist. This, you know, the things that I was telling him, I got that pushback, that system pushback, or actually no response at all in some cases. And so it was, it, it, it takes a toll on you when you get that kind of pushback because you think you have no power. You have no way to change or, or protect your own children in a moment when they're being um, basically assaulted by the curriculum that they're being presented mm -hmm. with. And so you feel no power, but I found that through this organizing and through this movement that we're, I was able to find allies and find that power back and say, mm -hmm. you know, I don't have to deal with that and I don't have to be um, powerless. And so I was able to, with the permission of my, my son, you know, amplify that what is happening and ask for change mm -hmm. and demand from my community to go to the people who were abusing their power. Because, you know, as Esma said, as a power comes is, you know, it depends on how you define it. And I was using my collective people power. Mm -hmm. I am doing that now. Whereas they're using their structural and white supremacy power to hold that mm -hmm. against me. And so we are now together um, fighting against that. And, you know, it's it, these are those little moments where we can move that needle together and 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 change the system and hold a, our, our 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 white supremacist values accountable and and get them and get them get those those harmful whatever that is going to our kids um, removed permanently and so nobody else like me has to feel powerless mm -hmm. so that's Incredible. that's what I wanted to bring to that because you know, oftentimes I feel like without power and it if it wasn't for rights and democracy and if it wasn't for the many, many places that I have found this um, collective uh, understanding and validation, honestly, because sometimes you cr you think, what, am, am I the only one that sees anything wrong with it? And, and the power came to me through all of the people to be able to step up and say, this is wrong and I'm going to fight for my child and continue fighting. And I have the validation and the people behind me to do that. Mm. Beautiful. Well, I'm so, yeah. Thank you for, for being vulnerable and sharing, you know, what's personal for you about this. You know, I think that we don't do that enough. We, we talk, we're always talking from up here and we need to bring, you know, that I think we really reach people from our hearts and from our personal stories. So thank, thank you, you for, for and I will name yeah. that school, Mount Anthony Union High School in um, Bennington, Vermont. There you go. Yeah, put it yeah. out there because people need to know. And I just think that what you really brought me there to what, what, what Garza kind of describes organizing is, is she says it's about building relationships and using those relationships to accomplish together what we cannot accomplish on our own. And so I'm so glad that you're, you're finding something like that in your community where you felt like I can't accomplish and, and, and come up against this force on my own, but, but you're finding people in your community that, 
that are with you and they're willing to say, you know what, we're going to create a front and we're going to do something about this. We're not going to just let it, let it go. So Thank I'm you. glad you have that support. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Well, thank you all so much for this deep discussion. Um, can it's I really say, like how proud I am of like Mia though for like really doing yeah. this. I'm so like indebted to the fact that she's being brave and taking on this school. And I'm reminded of that saying, I don't know who said it, but like they came for, you know, the Jews and I did nothing and they came for, you know, this group and I did nothing. And then they finally came to me and I found nobody left to, to protect me. You know, Mia standing up right now is going to help every single one of us. And so just that going back to that collective liberation and like standing up, even if it wasn't like your specific community that was attacked, she was like, oh, they're attacking immigrants. Oh, they're talking Middle Eastern. Nope, not my, my son is not going to learn this. And this school is not going to do this under my watch. So like, that's what it means to be a freaking organizer <laughs> and bring us all in to say, let's bring our power together and let's, let's put a stop to this is amazing. So I just want to like put props out to like, Mia, you, uh, you are my inspiration. All of us, all of us. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I am just so humbled by the three of you. Um, it's just an honor to share this space with you all. Um, and I'm just, um, I'm really hopeful for the community that we can build in, in discussing these, these incredible principles um, in, in our movement reading group, um, you know, not just to kind of further our, our own education, but to just be able to build relationship with each other, to be able to just have any solace and just connecting about what's going on in our lives, just like Mia brought in what's going on and how this is like, you know, this is not <laughs> abstract. This is like in our everyday. Um, so yeah, thank you um, for this discussion. Zaria, Esma, Mia, I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, so, you know, we're, we are, um, we're trying to promote this reading group. We're, we're, we're trying to recruit for it, get more people to join. The more perspectives, the better. Um, our first meeting is going to be on March 28th. And um, you can sign up through the link in the comments. I believe um, Annie is going to be posting them on this Facebook live stream. It's my first Facebook live stream. <laughs> so, um, so she'll be posting the link to sign up for our movement reading group. Um, you can get a copy of, again, this fantastic book that we've been discussing, The Purpose of Power. Um, we highly recommend that you order it through a local bookstore, support some local businesses. Better yet, if you were to support Nancy, our dear friend who owns Everyone's Books, which is in Brattleboro, Vermont, you can call her up and she'll order it and she'll send it to your home. Um, and then it's, she's an independent seller and we're proud to partner with them for um, our RDI movement reading group. And then an alternative option for getting the book is that you can make a donation of $50 or more to the Rights and Democracy Institute. And then we'll send you a copy of um, Alicia Garza's book for free. So that's another alternative option. Uh, anyway, um, but participation in the group is free and um, we'll be meeting starting on March 28th and we're gonna be meeting once a month uh kind of just like take the book in in chunks at a time and um yeah again thank you Esma, Mia, and Zariah um just such a privilege to talk with the three of you this evening and I know everyone's just really busy these days and it it's um I really appreciate you you three giving the time to share the space tonight thank you so much thank you thank you great so with that yeah 